You're listening to Design Between the Lines, the only design and home furnishings podcast where we talk with the movers and shakers, industry innovators, and lifetime legends of the home furnishings industry. It's here that I get a chance to sit and chat with the influencers shaping the industry into what it is today. This episode of Design Between the Lines is presented by International Market Centers. IMC is the world's largest operator of premier space for the furniture, gift, home decor, rug, and apparel industries, and operates nearly 20 million square feet of world-class exhibition space in High Point, Atlanta, and Las Vegas. With over 20 years of experience in design in the design trade, David Santiago has certainly embedded his distinct mark within the industry. His Strictly Santi brand is recognized for its unique flair that blends the traditional with the unexpected. David's roles also extend beyond his company, Casa Santi, as President-Elect and VP of Membership for the International Furniture and Design Association, New York Chapter. Welcome, David, as he joins us today for a discussion of all things design. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to have you here. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to go... Think back a little while and think back to your childhood and your growing up years and tell me what attracted you to the world of design as you grew up. So going that far back, I would say nothing. (laughs) Um, Growing up, I really, uh, it's funny that you bring that up because I was out to dinner with friends the other night and we were talking about some of my other passions and unbeknownst to you and a lot of people, animals, veterinary science, zoology, and marine biology were my thing. Really? I thought I was going to go into the marine sciences when mm-hmm. I was in high school, and I had this affinity for biology. Loved it. I did do a, you know, a little theater here and there at the high school, um, but that's where I was uh, going. Um, and shortly thereafter, when I graduated high school, I thought about financial marketing. So design didn't really come into it until a little bit later, my early 20s, I would say. Was there a particular inspiration that kind of turned you that direction or something that caught your eye? Or Absolutely. Great question. I was, uh, summer I got back from, uh, after moving out to California, um, I was painting and uh, working with a friend of mine who was doing some contract work called Light Carpentry. Mm-hmm. So I would uh, get hired to paint. So I, I was doing my neighbor's apartment and she also asked me if I'd do wallpaper. So I started, said, of course I do. And started hanging wallpaper. That's, we used to dip it in the water and put it up you know, like the old <laughs> days. Um, and a gentleman walks in with a tailored balloon valance. Mm-hmm. And I said, what is that? And he's like, I make these. I, it's a tailored balloon valance. I just purchased a workroom to the trade. Uh, why don't you come by? If, you know, if you're interested, I'll show you what I'm doing. Yeah. And that is where the seed was planted. Um, I quickly jumped at the opportunity, went to the shop, loved what he was doing. I was really intrigued by a world that I didn't know. And he said, you know, if you really want to uh, take a chance, I know someone looking for a young guy like yourself to do uh, to sell window treatments. And I said, sure. So I got a, an interview, walked in, and I, it was um, really a unique situation mm-hmm. and hired on the spot, entry level, ready-made window treatments with a custom window drip, with a custom window treatment department that eventually would be my playing ground. So the silver-haired ladies took me under their wing. I call them my designing women. And they taught me all about ready-made curtains and tiebacks and ruffles and bedspreads and coverlets and all these things, you know, soft furnishings. Yeah. Quickly thereafter, um, my guru in the custom window treatment department said, you got something, kid, come, come downstairs. And uh, quickly dove into custom window treatments and started learning about estimating calculations and things like that. Was this in, in California still? Or no, this back? was in New Jersey, Bergen back, County, New Jersey, back east, Nassau's okay. Window Fashions. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so you got something, kid, and moved downstairs. You started moving up in that side of the industry. Uh, were there... Did your education, did you go back to take courses and other things as you went along? Did you find No, because... Um, you were getting so much from the experience. I'm getting, the experience was really hands-on. I was really... Um, I, I love to sell. Mm-hmm. I think I was born a natural salesman. 
And I think I was born uh, to be a natural designer now that I can say this yeah. after 20 something years. Um, but my interest was theater. I was, I, you know, after coming back from California, I thought I want to study theater. Mm -hmm. I want to do it the, the right way. Let me go to HB Studios, Lee Strasberg, and do, do that kind of theater. Yeah. And that's what, where I was going. I thought I was going to be an actor and an <laughs> okay. honorary thespian. Yeah. Um, so that was my chosen education, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. um, which obviously took a whole new dimension and journey. Yeah. Um, Besides your designing women. Were there other mentors along sure. your path? Sure. I think at Nassau's Window Fashions, um, I had some great, great mentors. There was a gentleman by the name of Bob Mittenmeyer, and he knew that I lo loved what I was doing. And he said he, he mentored me every step of the way. And quickly thereafter, I was on the road selling custom window treatments. Um, and I quickly uh, became one of the top salesmen. Um, and soon thereafter... Calico Corners district manager was competitive shopping in mm -hmm. the showroom. She met me. Half an hour later after she left, she calls the showroom and goes, I just met you. I love you. I want you to come work for us. So me, being a neophyte and a beginner, I said, sure, where do you want me to work? And I mean, I knew of Calico Corners, um, but I went up to Ramsey, New Jersey, and uh, I became their window treatment specialist. I said, thank you so much to Nassau's Window Fashions for giving me this opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but Calico made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Wow. And onward with the journey. Sure. Wow. David, we, we kind of dropped the uh, the part of uh, uh, your, your thespian career, and <laughs> yes. and, uh, and we're moving. You're moving rapidly ahead on the design front. So, w w was there something going on on the thespian side at the same time? There was. I mean, I, I was uh, having a uh, this desire to be on stage and travel to somewhere in time for a couple of hours, you know, mm -hmm. because of an author, mm -hmm. and eventually because of a musical. Um, I did a musical. Calamity Jane. I did the role of Wild Bill Hickok, which was my first musical. I wasn't really a singer, uh, but because of Linda Farias, who, who hired me for the student production, mm -hmm. um, after the production said, you know, David, you should go study music, go study voice, become the triple threat. You've got the movement, you've got the acting, You let's get your voice going. Wow. So, um, sh quick story, I went to Manus Conservatory of Music. They had an extension program. And I learned, I took courses, how to read music, basic ear training, theory. And the voice teacher there um, saw something in me as well and said, you know, you've got something, kid. I've been very fortunate with that phrase um, yeah. throughout my life. And she prepared me to audition for the program and I got accepted. Wow. To that's great. To Manus Conservatory of Music for uh, a voice major. And that's where I fell in love with opera, opera. Uh, or classical voice, as mm -hmm. we like to say. Yes. I'm going to come back to that a little bit. We can, later. yeah, sure. We'll get there. We'll get there. I, <laughs> I'm very interested in that, as you already know. We had a chat earlier. Sure. <laughs> uh, but I have another thing on my mind, uh, because I've heard this phrase used by you. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to say to everyone on the air that, that we are sitting in the middle of a design home. Can you tell us where we, where we are right now sure. in High Point, North Carolina? Oh, absolutely. This is quite a home. Um, this is the Junior League's uh, Designer Show House with Aspire Home and Design Magazine. And it's a first here at High Point uh, with the magazine and uh, I think the Junior League's second show house. And it's a beautiful arts and craft home that is showcasing 24, 25 designers up from all different parts of the country. Some local, some from New York area like myself, some from San Francisco. So it's, and it's awesome. Uh, I've taken a tour. Uh, if they do another one, everyone, I, I absolutely say you've got to come and see this. Uh, your wallpapers are incredible and what you've done with your area of the home, incredible, David, my compliments. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've been this, so I'm going to say, what in your, in your terms, in, from your point of view, does it mean to be santified? To be santified means to get uncomfortable and embrace the unknown and take a leap of faith with a professional to guide you to ultimately define you, yourself, your home, your project, your brand. Um, I, I love to do the unexpected with the traditional elements of my projects in, in any style across, not traditional style. We're talking just the traditions of modernism and um, arts and craft, contemporary, traditional, neoclassic. 
Well, and, and, and this brings me to, to, to delve into that a little further. Obviously, you got to deal with the client and you're understanding the client and what they're, what they're trying to, where they want to go with whatever it is they've got on their mind that they want to do and have you do it for them. How do you get them to, I'll use a, a pat phrase, unfortunately, sure. you probably have a better one, to be sanctified or to push their personal envelope out a little bit? I think if they ended up, contacting me, I think they're ready to, to seek professional help. Um, I'd like to believe that they either know something about me or I've been referred to them. They've seen my work. Um, and I'm known to making people, my clients at ease, really get comfortable with the unfamiliar, you know, to make them comfortable with the color red in a way that they normally wouldn't be. Um, and I, I just have this natural knack as we say, um, to work to work that way, we have that ability to ease someone into, you know, doing a great jazzy wallpaper on a ceiling or you know a bookshelf or utilizing color in a in a different way. I love the mix of patterns you've you've done in the hallway, going from first level to second level in this wonderful home we're in right now. And uh, and when I when I look at that and I and I see it and I I want to ask you. Uh, you know, how does the show house experience uh, pertain to your work as a, 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 a professional designer? Does it does it feed you? How does it does it energize you when you're involved in something like this? It's new and fresh, and it's never been touched in. I will say because I live in this town, quite a few years after it burned, it sat here, and now seeing this thing come back to life, I I'm overjoyed to see it. First of all, for the family who first grew up here, we know them, but. How was it for you? How was that experience when you came down here and you had to put your mark on this? Exactly. I saw it when it was two by fours after after the fact. And, you know, I had a, a little bit of a re reservation taking this leap of faith with all of this, uh, you know, color and graphic element and idea that it might be a little too far. Uh, but the uh, homeowners of the, of the house embraced it. They're like, we love it. It's color. It's energy. And it's movement. They understood it in a very unu unusual way. Yeah. And I was really grateful. Um, you know, uh, and I, you know, named the concept Hospidential, which marries my two worlds of hospitality, which is very new to me now with the wall covering, with mm -hmm. Bijou, uh, Bijou wall covering, and the residential design. Um, you know, it's, an inf it's my influences from the boutique hotel industry, from traveling mm -hmm. from the West Coast to the... East Coast. I wanted to infuse all of that in this, you know, in the space of the, uh, which of brings the house. me to the, my next question because you do travel a lot, and uh, and and I'm in past great uh, contemporaries of yours that I've talked with on, on previous podcasts. Uh, travel means a lot to to all of them because it literally. They're like sponges. They pick it up. Yes. So tell me about, you know, when you're traveling, you see uh, global and even regional influences in design wherever you go. And, and, and let's face it, regions of this country are different. Sure. And view things differently and view color differently than, than other regions. Uh, that's sort of merging a little bit these days. But how do you see, uh, how do your travels affect what you do? I think the perfect example of travel affecting me is the Passport Wallpaper Collection. It just so happens that I, when I was in Venice, I was walking through the streets and I saw the iron window grids and the iron doors and these patterns that uh, simulated my, that had a reference to the movement in my logo, my Strictly Santi brand. And I thought, hey, there was a Strictly Santi in Venice at one point. And, um, and going back to even our travels here domestically, I was in Portland, Oregon uh, for the Interior Design Society uh, Swatch event last spring, and all the iron doors on the old banks spoke to me. So it's in our own backyard, uh, some of these influences that are across the oceans. Uh, it's just wonderful how things speak to you, and then they reveal themselves when you're working on a particular project or designing something. So you'll literally pull something out of your memory that's that stuck there from a trip you were on mm -hmm. or a place you were in and go, oh, this could apply here. Is it's almost like a sense memory. I got you. you know, okay. Which we use in music and theater. You yeah, know? which again or, brings or, us back to that that intersection of design and, and music. Absolutely. Um, tell me about the New York design scene. 
What's going on up there these days? The New York design scene is growing. It's changing. It's forever trying to keep up. Um, I like to say with High Point. <laughs> <laughs> I think High Point sets the tone for the, the nation. Um, but, you know, the New York design community is always looking for what's new, what's next, who's doing who's doing what, what, what are they, you know, working on. Uh, we've got some wonderful interior designers in New York that set the tone and raise the bar with elevated design and working in show houses, you know, in New York, like Kipps Bay, the mm. upper echelons of show houses. Oh, yes. We have uh, designers that repeat show houses after show houses. Barbara Olstrom is like the show house queen. Um, <laughs> so we look to them every, and to see what they're doing and working on because there's a level of respect and we like to tip our hats off to our significant others in the industry. At least I do. Sure. I love celebrating other interior designers. Mm. Well, speaking of that, you worked with a few here in this house. How was it like working with them? And uh, you've met new people. I'm sure you've never... I met new colleagues. I, I was acquainted with some of them. It was wonderful to see them doing exactly what I'm doing, you know, starting from scratch, creating a room, having a conversation with themselves, and then also just inquiring about their journey. Some of them are veterans. Some are new. This is my first complete show house that I've done. I've contributed to others. We have first timers that, uh, like Nicole Fuller here in uh, Nicole Culler yeah. in uh, here in High Point, doing her closet. She's my yes. hallmate. Um, she started her business about a year ago. What a great opportunity for a young designer starting out, and I get to meet with her and work work with her. And I feel like she's a veteran of the industry. Well, you met. You mentioned New York. We talked about that design scene. You mentioned. Uh, the fact that they're trying to keep up with High Point. I think so. <laughs> how, how do regional trends in your mind grow to become national trends? Uh, I mean, it, how does that happen? I mean, enough people see them? What, what did social media bring that about? I, social media is a good way. I think when you have some of the top designers doing doing things, um, designing, right. uh, design concepts. Design concepts with a lot of these higher end designers or let's use a more modern word influencers right. so setting the tone and giving brands and uh, and companies opportunities to expand outside of their comfort zone and bring in elements of those designers or actually you know establishing collaborations and uh collections thank you that was good that was an excellent answer i appreciate that <laughs> uh, you know, beyond color of the year, which everybody always talks sure. about, what other trends are bubbling to the surface these days in your your mind? What do you see popping up? I mean, you've been there to High Point. You've 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 done this house recently. You've you've been out. You've traveled. Uh, what do you see happening these days? What's what's the next coming thing? I guess I I like the 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 playfulness of shapes that I'm seeing, especially in upholstery. Mm -hmm. And accents, um, all of I, I love to use the word lyrical. All this curvature and movement, um, dare I say, a mid-century influence. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, upholstery is so curvy these days, and I love that. You know, I noticed that um, one of my favorite chaise lounges, uh, this market was at Norwalk Furniture, and I love what they're doing. Um, curves are my thing, and and you know, straight angles, also mix of metals. You know, that textile is, um, or that element yeah. is so prevalent in our industry and how they're using it on case goods and doors. And, you know, it's really unique. And it's it's scary how fast these, these things come to fruition. Suddenly one market, it's, it, you know, someone's showing it and then, you know, it follows. It's, it's a, a domino effect. Open concept living. Mm-hmm. What's your thought about open concept living? In theory, I love it because I'd love to be able to be in, in an open space where I look around and I see my loved ones or my, my friends hanging out um, from an acoustical play way, sound and the way sound travels and things like that. I think that that's, that you need to know how to navigate because, um, and I'm talking maybe a larger space like a loft. Right. Um, but I'm working on a project right now in uh, Creskill, in, sorry, Wyckoff, New Jersey, where we did a renovation, mm -hmm. full kitchen renovation. And they were thinking about an open, open floor plan and knocking down the walls and open dining room and family room. And I stopped it. I said, absolutely not. Let's keep the integrity of some of the architecture of the house. Let's have the family room be accessible and open, but not completely exposed and have four, you know three or four rooms fully exposed. So I am pro the idea I just think it has to be executed in a very strategic way. 
Well, I think your your musical talents and your ear probably has a lot of play in that when you're talking to them about how sound travels, as, as you mentioned earlier. Amen. Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, we were just chatting a minute ago about about different things in design and regionality and so forth. But and one of the things that occurs to me, and especially walking up the hallway you, you just did in this wonderful show house, is, is your use of wallpapers. Um, where did your inspirational use of this, well, these wallpapers, where, where did that use in your interior design philosophy come from? I think it was the texture and pattern play. Um, it was a way to, to add another element of design, uh, you know, outside of color yeah. and playing with color and giving room a little bit of dimension and depth. So um, I fell in love with wall covering and wallpaper um, from the old school to the new, and it and it's changed. It, it has just blossomed in the industry. I felt like I was the prince of wallpaper. It was kind of like an ode to the prince of chintz, Mario Buada, <laughs> one of my my, you know, inspirational designers in the industry. He did a lot with glazed chintzes, and that's always resonated with me. Let's bring that back, why don't we? <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about where you where you came from in in the world of of uh, window treatments and and colors and patterns back then, and now you're 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 doing something similar with walls with a with a blank wall. You can just create art. Absolutely, and um, and you know with uh, wallpaper, you can wrap furniture with wallpaper. You know, Tebow Wall Covering has a wonderful collection of case goods all wrapped in their raffias and grass cloths, even vinyls. Um, you can put, you know, the back of bookcases. You could put them on ceilings. You could line the front of drawers. Uh, it, it, you, you could put them on doors. Um, it's just not the for, the for the four walls any longer. It, it could really do so much for a space. And I, everyone's embraced it. No one has said no to me thus far. <laughs> That brings me to the next question, and, and what I'd like to ask you is, is, what kind of story do you like to tell with your design? I think the best story is defining my client. Who, who, you know, who's living here? Who's utilizing this space? Who works here? And that's my job as a designer, to walk in and go, oh, this is a young professional, or this is a family you know, a lived-in home, mm -hmm. the, the lifestyle. I love a home that gives you great design aesthetic, great vibe, yet says, I live here. I'm relaxed, I'm calm, cool, collective. Uh, the house has a little swag, a little noise. Um, that's, for me, speaks volumes. I love walking to a space, especially when I don't know a designer, and I just understand them on how they used um, the space planning, form and function, lighting, accents, things like that. I'm going to ask you, this is the fun part of the conversation. Sure. <laughs> we love fun. What, what, what have been some of your great, greatest successes in your life so far? What would you, a couple of achievements that you, you earmarked to yourself saying, oh, yeah, that's a good moment for me. I would say, I'm going to start with um, my passion, opera. Hmm. Um, while studying music, I was fortunate enough to be hired at New York City Opera. As a character, I'm a super you know, holding flags and spears and being with that company for almost 10 years and meeting some of the iconic opera stars that I loved and envied and uh, getting an education with a repertoire company. That is one of the high notes of my, my life. Um, and then I would say probably starting my interior design firm after being in the industry in, with many different positions and, or, and titles yeah. and deciding enough money for everyone else, it's time <laughs> to make it for yourself, kid, start a business. You can starve a little bit the first year or second year, set your goals, and I did. And um, I had a five-year goal that was met on my fourth year and it's been growing ever since. And then establishing my own trademark and utilizing everything I've acquired on walking the beat, as I like to say, yeah. you know, in the industry, hands-on, and making a name for myself, and uh, hopefully growing into a larger brand, or an umbrella brand, to collaborate with other co companies. Would you like to get into product design? Have some sure, time? I mean, right now, this wonderful collaboration with American Brass and Crystal, mm -hmm. bringing color and uh, unusual draping and crystals to lighting is a wonderful 
uh, stepping stone. Like, it's a whole new look. I mean, people in this show house that we're sitting in today have really remarked on that, that being a striking uh, step forward. Thank you. It's a wonderful way to utilize color mm. in a traditional way, you know, yeah. with a traditional fixture, let's say in this particular case, um, and with the unexpected. Color does not have to meet, you know, a, a color chandelier does not have to go into a kid's room or a nail salon yeah. or and yeah. be so specific or literal. That yeah. I'm not. Um, but also, you know, launching a little wall covering collection in the hospitality world, not something that I ever thought I would do for my first wall covering mm -hmm. collection. So those are high notes right now that I'm having. And um, last but not least would probably be January 10th, mm -hmm. my Carnegie Hall solo debut uh -huh. um, in concert. It's I mean, coming up. It's coming up. I'm having a great year and starting a great year year a different in way <laughs> well and, and you've mentioned high notes and a few other things and speaking of notes do you have a couple for us um I w i'm going to defer on that <laughs> and maybe we could save that uh, if you get to carnegie hall come january, january 10th, 10th january 10th carnegie hall <laughs> carnegie everybody hall. write that down those of you who are in new york if you're not in new york and you're just a train right away come on down or maybe at a in a bar one night when i've had like a bourbon or two <laughs> you may get a serenade for me but um the fun part of this part of the conversation is we've talked about greatest successes. Now we're going to say, tell me of a learning experience you ran into along the way in your design profession. And when you go, hmm, okay, you may not call it a failure. You may call it, I like to call them learning experiences. Like, hmm, learn something there. Any one of those you might relate to, especially students that are learning. Actually, I just heard something this market last, this week. And, um, he said, you know, you don't want to get into a fight with a gorilla. Ah. And it spoke volumes to me, meaning, you know, you don't want to bite off more than you can chew, especially with veterans and the big guns of the industry. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily to me, so to speak, it was in conversation. And it was another life lesson, you know, think before you speak, know who you're talking to and, and how, how and what you want to convey. So I'm forever interested in learning. I'm not going to presume, you know, to learn, to know that much. Yeah. Um, I know what I know, but I, th I think staying hungry and uh, always being open to being mentored makes us better. That, that is an excellent point. I, don't, I, th I think I answered the question. Uh, no, you did, and okay. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah, it's really, I was poignant moment. I was just like, ah, <laughs> and it just stopped me, mm. just stopped me, yeah. as if I... Not that I, I'm, I was going in that direction, but you know I'm a growing brand, and I love to pry, I love the journey that I've, I've had and coming to High Point and knowing High Point and the veterans of the business, as long as I have. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for that. Uh, in your opinion, today we're we're coming up to the present day now. Sure. Yeah. Um, and and more of a, uh, in in a way giving advice, but in your opinion, how, how is design shifting to accommodate today's consumers? You know, it seems like that shift is occurring faster and faster and faster all the time. Absolutely. Um, online presence is beyond control. I'm even starting an online shopping store with my company and my business mm -hmm. just to, to continue, um, growing my business in a different dynamic. A, you know, a different medium. Right. You know, I'm, I'll am i show up at your house or show up to my client old school mm -hmm. and lay it out and sell it to you right there. But um, to expand on that, online presence is so, so prevalent right now. And it's changed our industry. Um, but I always advocate to everyone, come to High Point. I mean, I'm talking about High Point. Shop at High Point. Buy here for your clients. Mm -hmm. This is what High Point is about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, and I'm hoping that that is still a current trend with designers today. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to do that with, have that experience with a screen. It's better to do it in person. Is that what you're saying? Sure. Yes. Yeah. That's why I, I, I started coming to high point is, you know, with my employers, but, yeah. um, you would, you go to these companies, right. the Bernhardt's and Nor walks the centuries to EJ mm. Victor's to experience the quality of the craftsmanship, touch the finishes, sit on the upholstery, know how the pitch of a chair is. Yeah. And then you can convey that and relate that to your clients. I'm going to use a current phrase. You and I have heard this market is particularly, and this is being recorded uh, October 2019. Um, 
is investing in the experience of home an idea whose time has come, you know, about the experience. It seems like it's about the experience. It's like, you know, it's, it's taxes, dummy. It's about the experience, dummy. You, you, you're getting a, more people are thinking experience than comfort. They're thinking about what is the experience like being in my home that's expressing me to my friends and relatives and folks that I have as, as visitors. What, what is that experience like for them? What do I want them to feel when they come here? Is, is, that, a, is that some of the nomenclature? Is that some of the thinking that's going on in interior design today is creating an experience as much as a, a, a product that is an interior? I would say there are elements of that. Okay. You know, I know that I'm working, when I'm, projects I'm currently working on, I'm going, what's going to be the, the family experience in this home? Who's going to be here? So you've got mom and dad, you have their daughters, and then you have their grandchildren. So the experience is family, a sense of, uh, you know, lifestyle community in this new space where the daughters grew up. So in that particular case, yeah, it's a new experience. It's, it's a uh, it's a home that's been traditionally updated and refreshed. So I think experience, we all want experiences. Um, it's a great question and it's really up to us designers to define uh, the space to have that experience have longevity and not feel short-lived. That's really important, the short-lived nature and the long-term. That's fine for that. a restaurant, but maybe not a home. Not a home. Well, finally, I, I come to a, a part of uh, our, our podcast that I always get to and, and I really look forward to hearing what you're going to have to say. And that is, um, do you have any advice for students and young professionals who are maybe right at this moment, they're thinking about it, where's their next direction? What do they really want to turn their career towards? Or where do they want to turn their education towards hanging their shingle out in a particular career in design? Do you have any advice for them on, uh, in their thinking of, about design and a design career? What it's should a, they be thinking of doing? It's a good question. I think now more than probably when I was learning the industry, um, the education and the programs that are available are by far so much more accessible. Um, computer technology has changed the game. It's really important to have that you know on your resume. Um, right now I have an intern from High Point University that I met two summers ago. Mm -hmm. And she's still with me, and I've seen her journey. Um, but I would say to students that are looking perhaps for internships, to work with companies that are going to give them the experience and the life experience out in the real world, it's fine to go get a cup of coffee and do some filing. But I hope that they're getting or asking in a tactful way. Yeah. Um, I want to be involved, to be involved, not be afraid to participate in their own design journey. It's really important to get out there and to, and to have conversations with um, designers like my, myself and our industry uh, so we can design it forward. So reach out, make contact, engage. Ask questions. Stop looking at the phone. Make eye contact because there's nothing better than a voice and a handshake and you know, a pair of eyes that you're connecting with that's going to remember that physical and spiritual connection. Chemistry is everything in our business, and it could leave uh, plant a seed that will grow a year later and sprout. You just never know. And I never expected a wonderful conversation like I've had with you today. David, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for spending some of your valuable time with us and allowing us to take a moment and look at this beautiful work you've done here at the show house in High Point. Well, thank you for, so much for having me, and I thoroughly enjoyed this this conversation. It's been uh, a segue into many different roads and avenues in my journey and ultimately ending up here with our hospitential concept at the Junior League Designer Show House. Thank you, David. Thank you. Design Between the Lines is produced by Element Studio with the International Society of Furniture Designers. We record in High Point, North Carolina. To find videos of these podcasts, be sure to subscribe to the International Society of Furniture Designers YouTube channel. To learn more about ISFD, visit isfd.org. And don't forget to subscribe to hear more industry stories of design between the lines.